Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel again this week for what is no doubt going to be another week of madness across economics and the financial sphere. Now, I want to get into the main story today, which is all of these new surveys that are coming out, not just from people on the street, but right through to the, the biggest organizations on the planet, which are doing a lot of surveys around different economies. And it is very clear to see or to say that the UK is in big, big trouble. And I don't say this lightly. I don't mean, you know, there's a small percentage between the UK and other nations. No, it is so enormous in terms of what is coming for the UK that it just blows all of the other wealthier nations, shall we say, out of the water. But before we get on to that, I am going to be doing this very shortly. I'm not sure when. This has just been announced. This is absolutely groundbreaking. It is enormous. I don't have time to do it today because this is going to take me at least 10 to 12 hours just to read through and make notes on this. But what is it? This is the new central bank digital currency for the UK, for the Bank of England, the digital pound. I've already started reading through it. I've put a couple of hours in so far and it is absolutely dystopian in nature and very, very worrying. But one thing that is clear with that is that you remember what my forecast was for the CBDC for the UK, the Bank of England. It was 2025. So spoiler alert, what they've just released actually aligns with that date of 2025. So we're going to get into that in another video. I'm really looking forward to getting into it all and just showing you exactly what they've got planned so that when we see that, we know how to prepare for that really well, especially if you are in the UK where what we've been talking about over the last, well, it's been two years now since my first forecast about the UK having these major issues first came out. And even my forecasts have been blown out of the water. Even I didn't see 19.5% 19, 19 food inflation at the moment in the UK. Now, you've got to put this into context as well. We are going to go onto the shared screen in a moment, but I just want to add a few points first. You've got to put this into context. This, call it 20% food inflation this year, that is just this year. That doesn't take into account the year before and the year before. That is just for 2023 to two period. So this is really bad. And despite them continuously saying that food inflation is going to drop and food prices are going to drop, they just keep going up and up and up. And today I want to show you the data which actually proves what I've been saying for a long time now and backs up the fact that we are in big trouble if you are in the UK and this is not going away anytime soon, even though they keep saying, oh, by the end of 2023, inflation will be down and, you know, the economy will be stronger and all these other things. That is not what the data says. That's not what the charts say. The charts say that this is going to get even worse before it gets better. So let's go to the shared screen now then. I want to kick off then with this Bloomberg article that was just released. Britons will get poorer faster than their wealthy peers survey shows. Now, bearing in mind, we're already, this just came out today, by the way, Britons are already getting poorer and poorer. And this is saying that this is going to continue. Uh, let's read this through then. British workers are poised to take a bigger hit to living standards than their peers in other developed economies this year according to a Bloomberg poll of financial professionals and retail investors, inflation will outpace pay rises in the UK to a greater extent than in any other G7 country. Yeah, and that's what we've been seeing, actually. We've been seeing huge amounts of protest, much more than most other countries, because wages are so far behind in the UK. Now, from this survey then, what did they say? Which country will see the biggest drop in standard of living. And look at this. This is th this is what I was saying in the introduction. This isn't just a few percentage points. This is 40% almost, almost 40% above the second worst, which was Italy. And Italy is, of course, 
one of the four nations which economists uh, refer to in a very derogatory term, but the pigs nation, P-I-G-S, and that is Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, which have always had a lot of uh, economic issues as part of the Eurozone. So even Italy, they are saying that only 14.7% of those surveyed thought that would be the worst. The UK is way ahead of everybody else. Essentials such as energy bills and grocery bills have risen in price even more quickly than the current headline inflation rate of 10.1%. Yeah, and they don't like to put what that figure is, but it's somewhere in the region of 19.5% at the moment. And of course, that's the official rate. So you can potentially double that in some instances to get a closer rate. That's why I keep saying to many of you, and for those of you who aren't in the private community, I just did a one hour long macro video over this weekend. I highly recommend watching it, as I highly recommend every month. That is what I spend the most time out of all my videos, creating that one hour macro video. It updates you on geopolitics as well as the macro space, the investment space. I look at every single asset class, give forecasts of where I think they're going. And although I'm not, I can't claim to be 100% accurate on all forecasts, it, they are very highly accurate compared to a lot of these other, even organizations that put out their forecasts. So I do highly recommend checking out that video if you can. I'll put a link below in the description to that anyway. But one of the things, just to give you a, a tip around this, one of the things that I actually mentioned was that I've put um, almost all of my cash or money in the bank, if you want to say that, into gold. So I bought that at a, a price that I think was very, very reasonable at the time. I didn't exactly time the market, but I did sort of look at where the best entry point would be. And it has risen quite nicely from that point. So I don't think it's any secret at the moment, for those of you who've taken my finance and stock market course, that I'm not in the stock market right now. And the reason why is because there is just too much risk and volatility around, around the market. But if I was forced to go into a market right now, I think the only one I would probably look at is something like the FTSE 100. If you're in the UK, probably not the 250, because the 250 is very domestic, you see, and we're having a lot of domestic problems in the UK. The FTSE 100 has a lot more, what's the word I can use here? Um, a lot more assets outside of, of the UK. They're not so much UK domestic focused. There's a lot more international income streams there. But I completely get it because I get these messages all the time and questions. I wish I could respond to all the YouTube questions and comments that come in every day. But it's just, I spend three hours just responding to messages daily in the private community. I spend up to eight hours making these videos daily and I have all my other stuff, and I have my property that I'm renovating at the same time, that there just isn't enough time in the day. I, I would really need to replicate myself. But my point with some of that is, is that although I can't speak to people one-on-one -on -one and answer questions all day, if you do look in the private community, you'll see what I'm doing with my funds, you'll see how I'm protecting my money, you'll see how other people, because we have a forum and we share, you can look at my finance course and see all my methodology and, uh, all the things that I do and the reasons why. So I just wanted to throw that in there as we continue. Now, the other major problem at the moment is food banks. Now, this is a really big problem. And the last time that we covered this was back in February, where we looked at how these food banks were now overwhelmed for a number of reasons. And that wasn't just because people had less money, but it's because food had become more expensive. So even those donations into the food bank, and I'm talking about monetary donations, it just wouldn't go as far to buy as much food. So there are really big problems. It's not just here, these are in other countries around the world. There was just a report out the other day about food bank had to be so large, it was held on a football field in the US and the line stretched twice around the field. So this is everywhere. Uh, of course, we talked about Hugh Peel on Friday. He said Britons need to accept that they're poorer and that this just is never, we're never going to go back to the same standard of living. Now, I do disagree with this statement. Yes, it may be true for the time being, but 
the way technology advances and the way you look at robotics and AI and all these other things, you look at the living standards of someone today compared to say 100 years ago, it's significant. You then look 100 years prior to that, again, it's significant. So yeah, we might see this short-term blip and we're probably gonna see a lot of problems, especially leading up to 2030, you will own nothing and be happy, of course, all these groups that are signed up to that. We're gonna have a lot of issues. I think that's, that's quite clear. But I think if you just play it right and you, you play this carefully, as we've been talking about, all of the different steps that you can take, and this is going back two to three years since we've been talking about this on the channel now, you can protect yourself well from inflation. But from some of the things I mentioned, from having a, a wood burner, from stocking up on essential items that you know, never expire, things that you would use on a day-to-day -day basis, like what ran out during the lockdowns, toilet paper. This stuff doesn't expire, but it does go up in price all the time. You can buy those sort of things, you can stock up. That way you beat inflation because, and I'll give you the example of when I told you about I eat soup for lunch. I love to eat different soup. So I went out and I bought soup when it was 85 pence for a can of soup. That same can of soup now is £1.70. So I've still got another year's worth of supply of soup, for example. And that is how you beat inflation in the short term. Of course, it doesn't solve that problem long term. But even things like we mentioned the wood burner, we mentioned all these all, all these other things that are spread throughout the different videos. You can adopt some of these things to not necessarily beat inflation, but definitely to reduce it. Now, of course, even the wood burner angle is a, a difficult one because these are being banned in certain regions now. And of course, the price of these things is just going up like crazy as well. That's if you can get them. The one that I've just ordered has an eight month lead time on it. Uh, so we are having a lot of difficulties. But I thought this was interesting. So this was another pulse survey that was conducted. They solicited ideas on ways to improve the UK's economic prospects. And in line with a jaded tone, several respondents called for a new government while an even more disheartened handful said that nothing could be done to improve Britain's lot. Another fifth called for the cutting of business and income taxes. Yeah, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Now I wanna show you, this is a genuine page from the BBC website, okay? I haven't made any of this up. You can go and find this for yourself. This is all articles on how to deal with the cost of living prices. What happens if I can't afford to pay my mortgages? Five ways to save money on your packed lunch. Five hacks to help save money on your food shop. How to cut energy and heating costs at home. BBC Foods one pound recipe meal plan for six. Rent increases causes 66 year old to live in a van. Nine year old who doesn't have a bed person who feeds her cat before herself. This is, this is pretty crazy when you start looking into all the stuff that the BBC is now putting out about these one pound recipe meal plans. Not to mention they have been saying for a long time now that price rises will ease soon. Now the thing that I don't like about some of these articles is they say that the price rises will drop back down and people will be able to afford their food again. It's just not true. When have you ever seen prices drop again? You don't, once they go up, they tend to stay there for the most part. And you look at some of the rises since last year, cheese up 50%, milk up 40%, broccoli 32%, sugar 32%, eggs 28%, chicken 25%, bread 21%. But it's not just food, it's mortgages as well. If you look at mortgages where they are getting stretched, London of course is the hot spot for this. So you're seeing prices going up all over the place. So is it any wonder that 700,000 households missed their rent or mortgage payments last month in April? I don't think it is. And not only that, this is where it gets even more dire. Nearly six in 10, so 59% of people reported making at least one adjustment to cover essential spending such as utility bills, housing costs, groceries, school supplies, and medicines in the past 
month. So just like we talked about, people are starting to cut back dramatically now, just so that they can afford the essentials of food, energy, and housing. Now, you look at how many households there are in the UK, and that's 19.3. And we look at 700,000 having missed the payments. Well, if we just take the total number of households at 19.3 million, we divide that by 100, that'll give us 193,000 households would be a 1% miss. So we have 700,000, which roughly equates to 3.6% of people actually miss their rent or mortgage payments in April. But when you dig into this article a little deeper and you look into some of the data, it shows you that it's actually a lot higher for here it is renters so that's 5.2 percent so it's quite interesting where this is going to now the other thing i was surprised to see again this was just announced yesterday is that does this remind you of 2008 all over again this is the first uk mortgage lender to offer 100 percent loans since the 2008 crisis yeah because that ended up really well last time, didn't it, where you gave out 100% loans. And actually, when we dig into all of the information here, it actually talks about how people can't afford to get onto the housing ladder. And I think it's 17 years now is the average deposit. Yeah, here it is. So it's 17 years is the time to save up for a first time buyer to buy their first home. So what this company is going to be doing is giving people that can't afford to buy a home a loan in order to buy the home. The government's obviously happy with this. They said it will help to prop up the housing market. We won't see significant declines because of all this additional lending. Yeah, and again, this is exactly what happened last time. Now, I do wanna say one point on this because if you manage this very, very carefully, with people who have good credit, but they just can't seem to get out of the trap of renting, then I do think for a small number of people percentage, those people who are very reliable with their payments and they haven't missed payments, they haven't missed rent payments, then it can be carefully managed to get certain people on the housing ladder. And I do think that is a fair assessment. But the issue I have is that, and again, we're seeing this in the US and a few other countries at the moment, some of these banks and companies, and I mean shadow banks when I say companies, they want to just allow anybody almost to get on the housing ladder. And in the US, it's even worse. The worse the credit history, it seems as though the more they want to give people houses to get, to get on the ladder. It's, uh, it's mind-blowing, really. But looking back historically, when you give 100% mortgages, it causes a massive issue because if there is a housing market decline, a lot of people will just walk away from those houses because they've got nothing to lose, so why would they stay in the house? Now, another worrying statistic on top of the other worrying statistics for the UK is that credit card balances have risen by 9.01% in the year to February. That is very worrying, but it's in line with the forecasts. Another statistic we can often correlate to a housing market decline is the difficulty in first time buyers accessing the housing market. So getting onto the housing market for the first time. So when you increase by 6% to the average price of a first home, that means that you're gonna cut the amount of people that can actually get on the ladder. Now, when we look at the average debt then per UK household at 65,000, this may not seem a lot if you're in America or Canada or somewhere else around the world watching this until you actually look at what the average UK salary is. People often are surprised, especially Americans, when I tell them, that the average UK salary is only 31,000 or almost 32,000 pounds. Because when you compare this to average salaries in the US and Canada, etc., it is quite a profound difference. So this is pretty much two years worth of wages now 
on top of the high rates of taxation in the UK, which is why it's so difficult to get out of debt in the UK. But even worse, if we look at the UK inflation rate here, it is just not dropping at any significant rate. It is hovering still around 10% which is not good when you have an interest rate of around 4.25%, which is just not high enough to combat this rate of inflation. But they're trapped because if they raise this rate too high, then we're gonna have even worse economic problems within the country. And of course, the, the debt to GDP ratio is over 100% as well in the UK. So this is, seriously, you can see where this is going. This is getting, worse and worse and worse. Even core inflation is exceptionally high at 6.2%. This is when you strip out other things such as food and energy, etc. So this should not be this high at 6.2%. That is difficult to bring down. Now, as you can see, we, we could just keep going on and on and on all day with this. But the general point I wanna bring across to you is that if you are a UK citizen, things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. What we are seeing here is this trap now, as liquidity is getting destroyed as well, you're gonna see a lot more banks begin to tighten. And we haven't even seen a banking crisis yet or a financial crisis in the UK. And even if we don't see that in the UK initially, what do you think is gonna happen when these US banks start to fail, when some of the European banks start to fail? the UK banks are very interconnected with other banks globally. So we are gonna see a bigger problem coming down the line. And as always, I'm gonna say the same thing every time. Please just start to prepare for this now. So many people keep telling me they just don't think any of this stuff's gonna happen. But they've been saying that to me for two years. Oh, it's not gonna happen. We're not gonna have high, inf well, high inflations here that we, you know, people say it wasn't gonna happen. Oh, we're not gonna have any financial crises. We're not gonna have, wage stagnation, all these things are here now. But yet, if you go back and say, and you've probably done it yourself, you go back and say to those people, hold on, I said two years ago this was gonna happen, you said it wouldn't, and now it's here. They say, oh, well, yeah, but the government's gonna sort it out. So, you, you know, you're just scaremongering or you know whatever else people, <laughs> people say. You've gotta love a, an optimist in this sort of um, economic climate, haven't you? But we'll leave it there today. We're gonna to get into a lot more juicy stuff this week, but thanks for being a subscriber here. And just a reminder about that video uh, below in the private community or, or the finance course, if you are interested in that. Uh, take care, God bless, I'll see you tomorrow.